Danley. On tonight's program, we have uh, the master of manliness. Yeah. Steve Mansfield will be coming on tonight's tonight's program. New York Times bestselling author, uh, world renowned speaker, um, journalist that was embedded in uh, the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts. I'm sure we'll get some time to talk to him about that, though. What he's uh, primarily promoting tonight, on top of the fact that he is a, uh, a renowned political and religious commentator, is his new book, Men on Fire. Mm-hmm. Men on Fire is a book that is specifically about... It's about Ghostwriter. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that it is. However, Guy on Fire, Ghostwriter on Fire, Motorcycle yeah. on Fire. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, what was it? Bones on Fire and a Motorcycle on yeah, Fire yeah, with Chains on Fire from, from Hell. That was... That was no, Ghost Rider. Uh, Men on Fire. Yeah, Men on Fire, which is uh, not about spontaneous combustion, but rather <laughs> it is about the necessity of the modern man to be on fire uh, for God and in pursuing manhood, which I think is a really, um, it's a very interesting topic for a book. Now, he's got two podcasts out, both the Stephen Mansfield podcast and... And the Great Man podcast, and the words Great Man are smashed into one word. It's like a title, right? Like it a, it like, is. It's, it, it's like Florida Man. It's not a, talking <laughs> about a guy from Florida, right? It's or, I'm sorry, about, it's, it's not in general people from Florida. Right, yeah. It's Florida Man. Florida Man. Great yeah. Man. This is what Great Man is. Yeah, and uh, and I had a long, uh, a really hard time finding the podcast because of that. Yeah. I was actually looking for it for... Um, not to make myself sound too dumb here, but I was looking for it for about uh, six months, seven months, looking for the podcast. And I would type in like the Great Man Podcast, and it didn't exist there. And um, Great Man Podcast, and it wasn't there. But when you smush them up as one word, lo and behold, burr, 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 there it is. They so make, they make they make a podcast, baby. Yeah, yeah, they do. They they get it all <laughs> all there. We can cut that. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of this that's gonna get cut. Um, let's take a look at the actual press release. It says living as a noble man in a confused culture. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be a man? Our culture offers many examples of men from those who are successful and at work, regardless of the toll it takes on the rest of life to the bumbling clueless father of the disengaged youth caught up in technology In his new book, men on fire, restoring the forces of restoring the forces that forge noble manhood. That's, That's some serious subtext. Yeah. Uh, New York Times bestselling author and cultural commentator Stephen Mansfield argues that men were made for so much more than it, they are being shown. It's time to reignite the seven fires that ought to burn in a man's soul. Heritage, battle, destiny, friendship, love, legacy, and God. Well, Very cool. The, yeah, we were talking about, I want to know what these seven fires are. They're listed. I'm going to predict the future yeah. and say that this is a great episode and Stephen Mansfield is super awesome. I'm, I hope so. Um, he's somebody who, if not, we'll just cut this. Yeah. He's somebody who I've admired for a really long <laughs> we'll time. Cut this too. <laughs> yeah, boom. <laughs> Later, Steve Z. No, uh, I also really like this book, the Mansfield's book of manly men. What do you like the most about it? It's, uh, it's yellow. Yeah. And that it's was... got a really cool mustache guy on the front. So I will tell you, you I want to, I want to read it. I have not. While you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover. Yeah. This one looks cool. An utterly invigorating guide to being your most masculine self. There's a reason why I grabbed that book, and it has to do with the fact that it was yellow. That it looks like that guy. Yeah, that the, the, there was a, a Jack Johnson looking character on the front of it, but also the how about you? The fact that he was a New York Times bestselling author and he was in a Christian bookstore. I felt like those two things were that was a mistake. There's a yeah, mistake somewhere. Exactly. I was like, all right. Well, if he, he if. If this I mean, is there's Dave Ramsey and there's other ones. Okay, but those guys are very niche, right? This is a guy who wrote a a book about manliness yeah. and is also because normally the guys that write the books about like manliness, manhood restored, or all this other stuff, they're guys that aren't even known within Christian circles. Mm-hmm. That other Christians are like, well, who is this also, guy? Why it's is not he very telling cool. me about a man? Right? It's not very cool to. To yeah, say masculinity with, in a positive way. Right. And the exception of that, I think, is John Eldridge, who wrote oh, yeah. um, know him well. Wild and Heart. Know him well. Do you? No. No, yeah. So John Eldridge wrote <laughs> Wild John and Eldridge Heart. John Eldridge. He's got From a very, Shawshank Redemption. Uh, yeah, Great certainly. movie. Great name. Yeah, yeah, that is a cool name. That is a great name. It's almost name. as cool as John Elway. The football player? Yeah, it's a cool name. And we can cut this, too. 
<laughs> we did say we were just doing this to warm up. Uh, no, I'm just yeah. playing. Th- this is this should look. This is our show. Okay, at this point, this is it's true. it's me trying to derail you. And I mean, how many times I've said this? You're you're looking very snazzy in your suit. Oh, thank you. Reading a a press release. Yep. And I'm talking about whatever I'm talking about. I'm not sure. I checked out a little while ago. I'm just getting warmed up. Smash that like button. Smash your nose. If you want to get notifications, smash the like. You can't just click the like and subscribe button. You got to smash it. I want you to take your your remote control and get a hammer and just smash it. Do you see that Stephen Mansfield is entering the waiting room? No. Okay. There. I was waiting. In that case, then uh, I'm ready if y'all are. Yeah. Let's go. Sweet. Hey guys, welcome back to the Reverend and the Reprobate. Myself and Danny are here. We are just honored to be joined by the manliest of men himself, uh, Mr. Stephen Mansfield, a New York Times uh, best-selling author of The Faith of George W. Bush. Um, I'm most familiar with him because of Mansfield's book of Manly Men and also his book Killing Jesus. He has written a new book called Men on Fire, which is part of a trio that speaks directly about manhood with Mansfield's book of Manly Men, Building Your Band of Brothers, and Men on Fire. And so I want to start with asking you some questions about Men on Fire. Um, how you got inspired for the book, but really, as a pastor, the question that I have that is probably the overarching theme, um, it seems, of all of these, is how your relationship with God, how your faith um, influences what you feel like or, or what you see manliness as. It's a great question. Let me just tell you quickly that I had written Mansfield's Book of Manly Men and also a little book I call a movement book, a book we basically sell at our events and, and try to feed a movement with called Building Your Band of Brothers. And and before COVID, of course, I was speaking at men's events all over the world, but there was something I was unhappy about or something I noticed was missing. And it, 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 it men who were in men's ministries, men who were in men's movements and reading books and growing uh, good things were happening, but there was some kind of inner passion, force, get up and take it kind of thing in, in individual souls that I just found missing. And so I started giving thought to what that was. I, I knew it was personal. I knew it was individual with each man. And that's how I came up with the seven fires in Men on Fire. Um, they are intensely personal. They have to do with your family, your heart, your love, your relationship with God, uh, your friendship, the legacy you're going to leave. And so it's not just men in general and men countering the you know forces of this age and what have you, uh, but it really is intensely personal. So that's why I wrote the book. And uh, I'll tell you what, uh, my faith helps me understand manhood, first of all, as something that is uh, created by God. And that may sound simple, but of course, in our generation, especially in the universities that are criticizing manhood and masculinity so much, their assumption is that manliness, masculinity, is a social construct that it evolved and was created by men for domination uh, over the rest of the world, over, over women especially, and so that this is not something created by God. Now, certainly, I believe there's toxic masculinity, and certainly, I believe there's you know, perversions of what true manhood is, but I start with the assumption that man, God made men, and many of the things that are characteristic of men are you know, fashioned by God, that men need uh, controlled rowdiness in their lives, um, that, that men have a unique gift for bonding together, uh, the ways they're inspired, the way the power their word has, words have uh, amongst other people, et cetera, et cetera. All these aspects of manhood, uh, the guardian protector motif in a man, all of that's created by God. So part of my task is to help distinguish what's, what's godly, what's by design, and then what has just been a sinful construct that, that's been added on to manhood uh, so that manhood is in the crisis that it's in today. So that's, that's the best answer I can give you, I think, on that one. What are some ways that men do bring masculinity down, that we do give a, a bad name to that? Well, when we use the same strengths and abilities and, and, on, and the power of our words uh, that we've been given to ennoble and protect and build up and call out goodness in people, uh, especially those we're responsible for, wives, children, friends, etc. And instead, we use it to dominate. We do use it to curse. We use it to bust people up. Any man that's ever raised a fist to a, to a woman is engaged in toxic masculinity. He's abusing the gift God gave him of his physical strength uh, to dominate. 
uh, the power of words. Men have exceptional power of words. I'm, I remember almost everything my army officer father ever said directly to me about me uh, because it was so powerful, so transforming. And so most of it was negative in the early days and then later became positive and it, and it transformed me. So when men allow what is God ordained about them to be perverted, to be deformed, um, I mean, their appetites, they're, they're meant to be aggressive. They're meant to be men. Uh, men, are, men are meant to have to, uh, appetites and drives. And uh, I, I believe every man ought to have some form of controlled violence, ought to be breaking a barrier of performance in his athletic life. Even if it's just mall walking for a 95-year-old guy, he needs to be pushing against a barrier. All that's God-ordained stuff. But when that becomes about doing destructive things, um, when, when the sex drive we've been given becomes about you know shoving 20s in some girl's underwear at the pole, or having a series of affairs, or fathering children we're not responsible for, all of that I perceive as perversion of the gift we've been given. You hmm. talk a lot in um, your your books and in your Great Man podcast about the necessity in your life of a band of brothers and how you, you put that together. And a lot of the things you just hit on, it seems like having that band of brothers in your life has prevented um, some of those uh, apparent stumbling blocks from interfering and causing issues in your personal life and in your marriage, in your ministry and and in your, your business. Uh, how is it that men as disconnected as we are can continue to move forward or push towards building a band of brothers? Yeah, it's a real important issue. And I think the first thing is men have to recognize they need other men. Uh, we are meant to walk alone. You know, you know as well as I do that the male suicide rate is skyrocketing in the Western world. And in England, when they do the postmortem, the psychological postmortem, they look at the suicide notes. Almost every single time, the notes say, uh, there's not a man alive on earth who knows anything about what's going on in my life. I don't have a single male friend anywhere close. Mm -hmm. They might have female friends, but their life doesn't have, really have meaning unless they have male friends. And when they get to a certain age, they have zero male friends. Well, then the kind of depression that leads, leads to suicide sneaks in. So men are usually walking alone. Uh, most men in the Western world have what psychologists call rust friends. Rust friends are like the guy who was in your wedding, but you talked to him maybe twice in the last five years. Uh, guys you knew in the army, guys you knew in college, but they faded. Maybe they're a phone call once every so often. True friends are close enough to know what's going on in your life without you having to narrate it for them. Uh, true friends care about you enough to speak up, speak into your life. So I'm a big believer in men having men intentionally building a band of brothers. Uh, our modern American lives, especially, grow us out of those relationships. And eventually, a guy hits middle age. He's got the house, the wife, the kids, the car, uh, the the career, he, and he's isolated. He doesn't have a, he doesn't have anybody he can name as a best friend. So I teach men to realize that they need to have a band of brothers, and then I teach them how to build that band of brothers. Which, for, even for the shyest guy, really, the core art is the art of the indirect connection. You put a bunch of guys, Pastor, listen up now. You put a bunch of guys in a fellowship hall and you have them all circle up chairs and look in each other's eyes meaningfully. And then you say to Bob, Bob, tell us what your tell us what your emotions are today. What are you feeling, Bob? Ain't nobody coming no, I, back. Next I don't week. have emotions. Ain't, ain't <laughs> no. nobody coming back next week. So what we got to do is teach guys how to have the indirect connection. Men get to know each other while they're doing something else other than getting to know each other. They're fixing the widow's house or they're shooting hoops and having a beer afterwards or they're whatever, going for a hunting trip, going, going fishing, you know, jogging, uh, watching the game with a hamburger in their hand, whatever. They, they, we do, we get to know each other indirectly. And then once I teach them the art of how to get to know each other, so even the shyest guy has this under his own control, then the goal is to get with a band of guys, start talking meaningfully about what it means to really be a man, start enlisting help. And what you're going for uh, is the free fire zone. The free fire zone is an arrangement amongst men uh, in which anything that needs to be said to make us better will be said. Nobody's going to be, you know, twiddling their thumbs and, and rubbing their hands. Going, oh, my God, I hope somebody talks to him. We're in each other's lives. We care about each other. We confront each other. We coach each other to our best. And that has made all the difference in my life. I'm a pretty competent guy, but I grew up as a military brat moving every year. So I was very alone. I'm also an introvert, even though I'm the kind of introvert that can do OK in front of people on stage. And I got to tell you, I was walking the first half of my life alone. And no major moral blowups happened because of that, but the loss of potential, the loss of my best self um, was just obvious. And now I walk very closely with a band of brothers, several different concentric circles of that, and it's massively different. It makes all the difference in my life. So anyway, I'm a big advocate for it and talked a lot about this in my book, 
building your band of brothers. Yeah, we uh, we often joke about with our men's group that one of the greatest miracles that Jesus performed is that he had 12 close friends whenever he was in his 30s. And that tends to be one of the, the greatest disparages that we're seeing, um, not just demographically where, where we're at, um, but but also one of the things we focused a lot of, of our t- podcasting topics on. We had a, a guy named Stephen Ryder on a couple of weeks ago who runs the Holy Smokes podcast, which is just a network of guys That's around exactly the world. exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, that yeah. all yeah. they do, they, yeah. they get together and, and smoke cigars. I know you're not a, a cigar guy. you got to save your throat but um yeah that it's uh it's one of those things where it it hits on exactly that point that you're talking about that we need to be doing something else because we won't sit on the couch and look longingly into one another we hardly do that with our wives yeah I, let I, alone I've, sit down with another guy after i we had we had heard that from steve i told my wife like listen listen if from now on if you ever want to just really sit down and talk to me grab a cigar and ask me if i want to go outside like i'll say yes and i'll i'll talk to you for hours while we're out there. So I, I really like the, the point you made about indirect, you know, getting to know other men indirectly. I had never thought of that. Yeah. But yeah, that's then, absolutely my, true. My, my, my favorite illustration real quick is that you can put five, you can take five guys who have never met each other, mm-hmm. put them in a pickup basketball game. And within minutes, they are coaching each other, encouraging yeah. each other, calling for the ball, chastising each other. Don't hog it, man. Throw it down. I'm free under the hoop. You know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, immediately we start big. Why? Because we have a task and we have an indirect connection. And by the time that game is over, these guys are heading out for a beer and a pizza because mm-hmm. they, they, you know, they feel kind of a kinship. And so that's, that to me is the model. When men have a purpose, when they have something else they're going after with other men, that's how they bond. Uh, I come from a military background, not me personally, but my father was special forces and I grew up as a military brat. And the guys my father was in foxholes with, the guys he fought in Vietnam with, they were his closest buds. Why? They'd had a purpose. They bonded. It went deep. And that's that's what men do. So I actually wanted to see, you had mentioned rust friends, which which I, I thought was a it was an interesting uh, coin. You also mentioned in the book, Men on Fire, uh, Idiot Man and Dog Man. I was hoping you could expand on those. <laughs> oh, I'm you, happy to. Uh, I really resent the portrayal of men a portrayal of men in our modern media. And almost every guy I see on TV is either idiot man. Or this is the guy who's doing a happy dance in his house in a commercial uh, because he found the remote control stuck in the couch somewhere. <laughs> he's doing a happy dance. His wife and his kids are in the kitchen rolling their eyes. Dad's such an idiot. And so idiot man is everywhere. Idiot man's almost in every television commercial. He's the idiot male who just is so stupid that nobody wants to be around like, him. Like Homer Simpson. And then, pardon? I was like Homer Simpson or, you know, something. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All, all those images, most television commercials, a lot of movies, just idiot man. Quite frankly, almost any middle aged man portrayed on television is idiot man. And then there's dog man. We all know what he's doing. He's thinking with his crotch. He's mm-hmm. sitting at the bar, shoving 20s into some girl's underwear. Uh, and then he sniffs the air and he goes off to some other bar and some other place. And so he's driven by his lusts. He's the kind of guy who produces children he's not responsible for. Uh, you know, he's, he's, just the, 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 he's just a dog is what he is. And I'm not those two men. You guys aren't those two men. But that's how manhood tends to be portrayed negatively if they're not just out and out portrayed as bu- uh, abusers. So I'm, I'm hammering those, those images because that's not uh, what most of the guys are I know. And I don't want young kids growing up with those images only uh, as the negative reflections of who they are in society. So, so what would you define as, as a, a true man, one that is called by God? You know, there's idiot man, dog man. What, what would you, is there a, another, another term for, for the correct, the man following the correct path? Yeah, for me, the correct path is to know that manhood is made by God and to, to seek to use all of your powers for noble purposes, for godly purposes. Now, that, that's almost a Sunday school definition, and I try to avoid religiously kind of language uh, when it comes to talking about men, even though I'm an outspoken Christian and a former pastor and everything else. But my point is that I, I believe that when men understand that God has made them awesome and powerful and, and meant for noble purposes, and then they start learning how to harness and use their powers for good. And when they realize the power, the power of word, their words, for example, I've mentioned this two or three times, to look into their 12-year-old daughter and say, you are beautiful. And I see amazing things in you. I I can't believe the way God's made you. Your future, I mean, it's going to be unbelievable to watch what God unfold, what he's doing with you. So I'm here to guard you and walk you through that. But I just want you to know I'm your biggest fan. 
And uh, and I'm thrilled with what God's done with you. I'll tell you what, if the average guy with a 12-year-old daughter would say something like that to her and mean it and then stick close to her, it would be transforming. Why? Because men's words are exceptionally powerful, particularly in the whole art of calling out destinies, of affirming destinies, of identifying destinies for the young. So there's just an example of what a godly man would be. So I think noble manhood is a man who's using his powers for good because he understands they come from God. Now, at the same time, I want to say very quickly, this this also is a lot of fun. Uh, I teach men they got to have controlled rowdiness. I teach men that they got to have a band of brothers, and it ought to be mainly fun, not just all sitting around confronting each other about their manners or their bank account or you know how they're handling their kids. It ought to be rowdy. It ought to be fun. My band of brothers and I have a ball. Um, but at the same time, while we're having a ball, we're likely to confront a guy while we're driving down the road just because he, you know, he's messing up. We want to tell him before we get where we're going what he needs to fix. And so uh, it, it's fun. It's, it's tremendous. Uh, it, it dispels the loneliness of our generation, but mainly because we understand who we are as God has created us. You've used a, a phrase a couple of times, and after reading your stuff, I'm, I'm familiar with it, but maybe our audience is it. What is controlled rowdiness? Because it sounds really cool. I'm in. Yeah, yeah, I, I want to be in. <laughs> but what's the, what's the working definition of controlled rowdiness as you're using it this evening? Controlled rowdiness is a, uh, is a hard-hitting sport. Uh, it's, it's a dad stripping down to his underwear with his six sons and beating the tar out of each other on the living room floor. <laughs> it's, uh, it's what we used to call smear the queer. We didn't mean that in any kind of sexual identity way. We meant that just in, you know, pound the guy who's got the ball, uh, you know, getting in the pool and beating the tar out of each other. Men need controlled routiness. Sports is basically controlled routiness. Um, we need to strip down uh, to our shorts and our hiking boots and go up that mountain on a cold day with steam just poured off our bodies. Everybody needs to have that. Now, not everybody is the outdoorsman. I'm not as much of an outdoorsman mm-hmm. as you might think. Um, uh, but but everybody needs to be doing something. Like I like, uh, you know, I'm working out hard to break some personal records. Uh, I've decided I want to hike 50 miles, take up that 50 mile challenge that uh, the Theodore Roosevelt and, and uh, John F. Kennedy challenged the military with. So uh, in my life, I'm, I'm working out to be able to hike 50 miles in one day and, wow. and come back. Um, it's you know it's going to take me a little while. I'm, I work uh, during COVID especially. I worked on body weight exercises and blew up records with uh, push ups. I mean I do, went from two to three. I mean it's wasn't anything <laughs> impressive. All I'm saying is that you're just working out trying to bust records. And so men need rowdiness. You know I, I wrestle all the time with my grandson. When he when we pick him up at school, he looks at his, his grandma who he calls BB and it's hi BB and he gives her a hug and he gives her a kiss and then he turns to me and he goes ah <laughs> and he's, it's 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 almost like a tribal greeting you know and the next the first words out of his mouth are Papa can we wrestle you know he wants to wrestle yeah. right there in the parking lot you know because that's a lot of our relationship is just stripping down to our underwear and whooping each other I, so men men need to have that in some form I admit not all men are wired exactly the same way and I'm not saying you got to go kill a moose and haul it back to civilization i've never had <laughs> i'm just saying that men need to do that have that in their lives for me during most of my life it was racquetball i would play racquetball for two hours sweat could when i came off the court i couldn't remember if my children were in the nursery where i had to be next my brain had cleared but i'd had two hours of all out war and i think we're made for that at some level each of us that's awesome i can actually say that lucas has done that for me the controlled rowdiness uh we've known each other for a very long time mm-hmm. and uh, I've been in a bad mood many of those times and he, he would always threaten me if I wouldn't get in a better mood that he was going to fight me. And he more on more than one occasion would fight me to, to get me out of that bad mood and it worked. So I got to give him, I got to give him that. Well, thank you. Um, you've, you talked about the, the way that your grandson greeted you and it seems, especially in listening to your most recent podcast, that there is this sort of uh, rite of passage and ritual that comes along with those kind of encounters, especially generationally that a, that a father or grandfather passes down to their son or grandson. Why are rituals in men, especially men of the same family, such an important thing? And, and why are we in, in sort of modern civilization or modern society, why are we moving away from those things? And, and how do you think that's hurt us? Yeah, I think rituals are unbelievably important. First of all, they're a natural part of life. As soon as a child is born, you know, I, I can tell you with my little, little four-year-old grandson, we do anything he wants to do it the same way next time. You read him a book at, at eight o'clock in the evening as he's going to bed. You're now going to read five books over the next weeks. It's going to become a tradition. You know, 
whatever we do, however we wrestle. And he'll stop me and say, no, Papa, we didn't do it that last time. We didn't do it that way last time. I mean, he'll actually arrange things so we do it exactly the same way. And if I don't say the, the certain words that I said last time, like, I'm going to get you. If I don't say it that way, he'll go, no, 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 you're not doing it right. Because he has this code in his soul for uh, ritual. And so we all know that families have rituals, children have rituals. The, the issue is that in our society, which tends right now to be a little bit anti-tradition, a little bit busting up the old ways, um, and definitely distracted with screens and media, social media, um, we are not doing the rituals that make life meaningful. I love the British tradition of tea, uh, having tea late in the afternoon when the family would come together and they'd have tea. Okay, it may not be uh, my ritual or yours, but it was something regular. It brought people together. It got them talking. Um, I, I decided to have a, a Christmas tea every year with my kids. You cannot believe what it's become. Now they've married and we got grandchildren. And it, the tea every year is, is, I don't mean to be blasphemous here because we all honor Christmas and, and all, all are Christians. Uh, so obviously we're, we're about Jesus. But that tea is almost like the biggest thing. Where are we going to be? Who's flying in where? How are we going to pull it off? And it was just something that I created. But it's a time when we talk and affirm each other and talk about the new year and what it means to us. So I believe in manly rituals. Uh, it doesn't matter to me what it is. If it's the two of you on your back porch with some brown water, uh, if it's a stogie fest, you know, around the fire pit, uh, if it's the weekly jog with the with the pizza and beer afterwards so you can check on each other, uh, whatever it is, I like rituals. I believe in them. I think we should be uh, initiating our boys when they just step into adolescence. There's that famous African proverb, if we do not initiate the boys, they will burn the village down just to feel its warmth. Mm -hmm. And that really is mm -hmm. the way it is. And that's why I think even street gangs have got initiations that mean the world to a 13-year-old inner city kid. So I, I come from a military background, as I say. Um, I, I come from a certain school of theology as a Christian, very ritual oriented in the good way of what they mean and how they affirm. And I'm a big believer in it. I think families can evolve them on their own. I think men should evolve them together. Um, and I think, I think it's, it's part of us reclaiming a healthy, wholesome, godly, masculine culture. Yeah. You mentioned the, the African proverb of the, if that, the boys don't have anything to do, then they'll, they'll burn the city down. Um, shifting gears a little bit. And I, I want to tie this into a question about men on fire, as well as what we're seeing societally today, that we, we have a lot of civil unrest on all areas of the political spectrum. And, and there's a lot of people who have believed that now they are politically homeless. Um, and a lot of the, the unrest that we, we believe that we're seeing, and especially in some of the people that we've talked to, is that they they feel like they have to fight against something because they weren't taught that. You say specifically in Men on Fire that we have to realize, you, you write about serving the season that you are in. As men, and we, we see all of these things that are, are happening around us, um, how do we serve in this season as examples of what godly manhood is in order that our our kids or the the men that we're you know banded with in this band of brothers aren't those that are are turning to burn down the village right now well it's a great question and i i, I gotta tell you i believe that when you're approaching ma manhood from a godly perspective you also believe maybe not a hyper predestination but you do believe that seasons are ordained for you paul said to the thessalonians don't be troubled by my, don't, don't be uh, disconcerted by my troubles. Don't you know I was destined for them? Uh, a Christian believes that there are seasons prepared for him, Ephesians 2.10, that there are works prepared for us in advance to, to walk into or to enter them. So COVID hits, and a Christian, even though there may be you know, sadness, and even though there may be a little bit of fear, a Christian goes, you know what? This is the, God knew this was coming. I'm prepared for this. I'm going to step into it. I'm going to own this thing. I'm going to do the right thing, love my family well. Uh, be a righteous man in this situation, use my gifts as a man uh, to help others, heal others, uh, strengthen my community, uh, make this a good time. Uh, you know, I, I said at the beginning of COVID on one of my podcasts, you may have heard it, that I, I, I expected by the time this was over, we'd have people telling us what we are, heard from uh, the period of the Great Depression. Uh, I have interviewed people who lived through the Great Depression and said our the, the family life, the culture, the richness, our home, our arts at home, our love for each other, the hobbies, the rituals. Uh, I never had a, a richer life later on. It was the mm. best time of my life. Now, that just sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? That the Great Depression, of all things, mm -hmm. would be the best time in your life. 
but I understand what they mean. They felt closer to people. The family would sing together. The mom would play on the keyboard, the piano, and they'd sing together. And everybody got work every day to earn the few quarters they were going to earn. But they'd come back and pool that. And they had enough to eat. And they gave thanks to God. And they'd have joke telling contests and listen to fun things on the radio. And it, they, they attested later it was one of the richest times ever. Well, that's the way it is when you realize you're called to something. You're called to a season, you're ordained for it. This isn't an accident, it's something that I am sent into, and I'm gonna own it. Uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna live it out well. I'm gonna live it out in such a way that when it's all over, uh, in a sense, there are parts of this that are my finest hour. Yes, I'm quoting Churchill, uh, that this was my finest hour. And, and my wife, Bev and I have tried to live through COVID very much that way, helping people, serving people, giving, uh, trying to be exemplary, trying to help folks, trying to live. So when we look back on the season, uh, we remember that we didn't just tremble on our couch in fear, uh, but that we made a difference in people's lives. And I think all of that is the way a good man, a godly man, approaches difficult seasons. That's a that's a lot to chew on. Yeah, I think as, especially here. And one of the I get to work really closely with our local police department. Um, we're seeing as much of this sort of good outcome of COVID as people rallying around one another. But it seems like the longer it goes, one of the troubling statistics that we're seeing is that we're also seeing this increase in domestic violence within the home. Um, and a lot of frustration that's happening as men are continuing out of work, but really a lot of it is centered around some of the, the homeschooling things. What would you say to men who are now uh, in the home maybe 30, 40 hours more during a week than they would be otherwise? What are the best things that they can do to deal with their, their children and the idle time that they have where they're not getting to go to work? How can they still have that warrior spirit at the home? Well, it's a great question. I, I, I think I can bullet point for it, for it real quick. First of all, don't see yourself as a victim in this process. Uh, see this as an opportunity. Now, that's a hard shift to make. But if a man's sitting home feeling victimized, he's maybe he lost his job or he's furloughed, so he's going to sit around and drink whiskey and eat Oreos and you know gain 40, 50 pounds and 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 just see him and just wallow in his self pity. He's not going to be what he's made to be. So number one, don't see yourself as a victim. See this as an opportunity. Number two, think of yourself as the culture keeper in your home. Uh, a man is meant to set the tone in the home. And I don't. I'm not just speaking by the way to married men, to single men. Same thing. I tell I, when I speak on university campuses, I tell roommates the same thing. You guys should be should be competing almost to create a noble, inspiring, encouraging culture in that dorm room on your wing uh, with your band of brothers. And so you be the culture keeper. Let your word shape, uh, you know, fashion a positive, inspirational, a righteous attitude in the home. Um, to have goals, to, uh, target goals. Like I was saying earlier, uh, I decided that I was going to work out even harder. Uh, I cycled a lot, played racquetball, but now, I mean, I got to get on the floor, push-ups, sit-ups, burpees, all the stuff. It's harder. It's actually physically harder. Um, but I set goals. I set it financial goals. I set academic goals and learning goals. I set physical goals. Uh, I encourage those around me, my kids. My, my son's 35, my daughter's 30, but we're all very close. And so I said, what do you want to accomplish during this time when it's all over? What do you want to say that you, you accomplished? And they're, they're tearing down uh, goals and we're encouraging each other. And my son's going to do that 50 mile walk I was talking about earlier with me. So he's up in New York where he lives, you know, work, running stairs and everything to get ready for this thing. So uh, it's, a, it's a matter of understanding that this has not happened to you, but instead God has sent you into it and that you can accomplish some great things. So really, this can be a time of accomplishment and achievement and advance. So on the other side, you are actually able to say, as it says in Psalm 119, it was good that I suffered, that I might embrace God's ways. And that's the approach I've had to this situation, to this season. Mm. So you mentioned uh, a little bit ago about serving serving the season that you're in. And you mentioned that with you and your wife, that during COVID, you've been able to help people and some of those things. But um, what what does that look, what does this look like for you specifically, You know, th this well, season? It, uh, you must have been spying on me. Let me tell you what I've been dealing with during COVID. <laughs> we've not only had COVID, we've had one of us had a serious health crisis. I don't want to go any further into that, but we've had months and months and months of therapy. Um, then both our sons, both our idiot sons, uh, I have a son and a stepson, uh, decided to get married within two weeks of each other. Congratulations, this, by the during way. During this period. Thank you very much. We're, <laughs> no, we're thrilled. And I'm having fun picking on them. Uh, but still, that was quite a bit. In addition to that, you're, you're going you're gonna to weep over this one. 
we've got two homes, one in D.C. and Nashville. I think you probably know that because of what I do in D.C. And both of them flooded during this time. Oh, both of no. them got doused by broken pipes of some kind. And we've had to have both of them rebuilt during this period. So since May, uh, we have had layer on top of layer on top of layer. But the good news is, thank God, first of all, for insurance. But the other thing, the good news is that my wife just look at each other and go, all right, I love you. You love me. God's with us. This is the season that we, I don't know why it's happened. I'm not telling you I'm happy about it. I'm not sitting here going, praise the Lord. My house got doused and I, her personal property was destroyed. But I am saying, all right, this was ordained for me. God knew it was coming. I'm prepared for it. Uh, we must go through many difficulties to enter the kingdom. Uh, I'm, I'm going to own this thing. And we're just about to get out of it. We're going to be out of it here in about six weeks. Uh, but I'm telling you that this has been a season that I've had to just say, I'm going to be a good man. I'm going to walk through this thing. I'm going to glorify God. I'm going to love my wife well. I'm going to be a better man on the other side. And uh, we're going to own this thing. And that's, I think that's the, that is a godly response. I haven't done it perfectly. And I've had my days of saying, saying Lord, I sure have better things to do with my time than sit around and talk to contractors about drywall. But still, uh, that's where we are, and that's how we've handled it. So you want to know how it looks for me. Everything I've just said, I'm living to the nth degree in 2020. It's been the most unusual year of my life. And yet, I'll have to say that I'm pretty much moving from victory to victory, tough as it's been, uh, because of the grace of God and these basic attitudes that I've been taught through my life by other good men. That's that's pretty incredible, and I I have to say that your sons must have a little something smart going on with them because I also got married during the pandemic, and, uh, hey. and thus far seven months in, it's it's working out pretty well. So you know there there is something to be said for uh, for having a partner during isolation. So we'll we'll leave it at that. Um, Great. With uh, with so many of the the things going on, if we can shift, you talked about you've got a house in Nashville. Um, I know your your wife Bev is is incredibly involved in songwriting and those kind of things. Is very talented in her own regard, and yes. uh, and you also have a home right outside of D.C. You do a lot of work in the political sphere, which I I will have to say is one of the things that attracted me the most to your podcast. Is as a Christian, and you do tend to be um, just to the right of center. Uh, they're just a a couple of issues that sort of push you in that direction. You you really do tend to take a very neutral position when we're having a conversation about good men, about noble men, and then we look at the options that we've been given mm. for the top leadership in our country. Um, it's hard to identify all of these, you know, these seven fires that you said and where they actually line up in their lives. We've been put now in a position where um, the the news media and the things that the presidents or the the let's say presidential candidates will put it. That that way are saying tend to be really opposed to one another. We've entered into a huge time of unrest. Um, what do you see happening? Let's just say in the next, you know, three to three to six weeks. Do you think that we'll actually have a declared president elect? Do you think that this will carry into the beginning of 2021? What do you see as a, um, a, a brilliant political mind that we don't sitting here in Dallas, Texas? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, there's an introduction to it. Yeah, topic. there you go. Um, I think that we will see this season of challenges and lawsuits dissipate within the next couple of weeks. And I would guess in the first couple of weeks of December um, that Donald Trump will concede um, that we will have, of course, I believe it's December the 11th that the official certification was scheduled to take place anyway. You have, I think, you know, you have elections and then the election has to be certified and that happens about five to six weeks after the election. So I believe it's December 11th that the election exactly certified um, that the Electoral College finalizes its vote, all of that kind of thing. And so I expect, um, I certainly don't blame Donald Trump in these tight races for filing a lawsuit. I, I don't think any major corruption has been found. Uh, I've asked my pollster friends and recent investigator friends in D.C. They can't, t some of them can't tell me everything that they know, but they've said no major corruption has been found. Um, so, you know, there's a little edge of corruption in every presidential election. I've always loved what William Buckley said. He said, my grandfather died in 1919, but he had such a strong sense of civic duty that he voted for Lyndon Baines Johnson in 1936. <laughs> and so that's, you know, there's always throughout history been a, you know, you don't know that the guy in the small town who's running the polls isn't, you know, slanting the vote a little bit or whatever. There's always that thing that's possible. But today, with the monitors and the lawyers for both parties and the FBI even and uh, people of different parties watching each other at the polls, even though they get along great. 
Uh, I think there's been very, very little corruption, frankly. And that's not me picking on Donald Trump. So I think we're going to see the lawsuits wash through uh, unless something shocking happens. Um, there have already there've been a little bit. Of, there's been a little bit of corruption on, on Earth, but it's not enough to change even one state uh, or even a county yet. Uh, and this is, I got to tell you, as a guy who's been a student of elections and a, a historian, this is this is normal. You you always have people later who say, "Hey, there's a like in one of Lyndon Johnson's uh, elections, um, an entire ballot box was found late, and every vote in it was for Lyndon Johnson." Well, that sounds like some corruption to me, but you know, he went on to the Senate and became president, vice president. So all of that to say. Um, I think we'll see it all washed through in the next couple of weeks. I don't think it's going to surface anything huge. And I think the first couple of weeks of December, we'll see certification and we'll, we'll start moving forward. That doesn't mean Trump's going to be happy about it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean the Trump and Biden are going to get along. You're going to see smiley faces over a beer or whatever. But I do think that you're going to see um, a, a, a transition that ends up with Joe Biden being inaugurated on January 20th. What do I think is going to happen with Trump? I think he's going to step out. I think he's going to be loyal opposition, not loyal opposition, but, but fiery opposition. I think he's going to continue to define the GOP. Um, and I think it's very possible he's going to run again in 2024. I think it's very possible. He's already talking about it. Yeah, we, we that actually, today. yeah, that was going to be one of our, our follow-up questions about that. I know uh, uh, I'd seen comments earlier this week from Lindsey Graham that said that he might actually support a 2024 bid by Donald Trump. Um, with with that in particular, you know, you you did write a book called Choosing Donald Trump that's specifically about the way that uh, a lot of the, I guess, sort of religious pundits um, backed Donald Trump, which otherwise would have seemed just completely ridiculous. Uh, why do you think that that a lot of the people that were, you know, quote unquote, God fearing or your religious leaders and now in the post 2020 election, we see that the largest amount of blue collar workers and the largest demographic of, of black people in particular voted for Donald Trump more than they have any other Republican candidate. Why do you think it is he's become so polarizing in these areas? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, part of the problem is that Donald Trump is his own worst enemy. He's actually done some pretty amazing things for minorities. Um, for example, I, I as you since you listen to my podcast, you already know uh, I work very closely with the African American community. I go to a largely African American church. I've got about a half a dozen African Americans in my family. Uh, I, I've guest lectured in African American history at places like Tuskegee and so on, and and I care very much about that part of the world. So, for example, Donald Trump's done more for historically black colleges and universities (HBCUs) than any other president of recent recent memory. Um, also, I want to move. We should move as a nation away from identity politics. But but the idea that a man improves the economy means all ships rise. Uh, you know, rising tide lifts all ships. And so he's 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 done a huge amount for African Americans. Done a huge amount for Hispanic community. Uh, done a huge amount for whites. Why? Because he has, in fact, or either he's inherited or he's engineered uh, an improved economy. Cut taxes. Uh, limited foreign, uh, you know, control of our economy, things like that. So he's done a lot of good things. The problem with Donald Trump is that he is louder than his message, his manner, him, mm -hmm. his bombast, his tweeting, his language, his cussing, his relationship with strippers, his insults. It's it shouts louder than the good things he's done. And I asked some people in D.C. Why didn't you run a commercial? where you know it would it was just basically saying listen to what donald trump's done like have tom Selleck get up on television and say what has donald trump done for us and start to list seven or eight things that he's done that would shock people like for example that he was maybe the best president for historically black colleges and universities in several generations um so the problem is that donald trump is the shiny object that's distracting everybody from the actual core message so that's the problem he, he's he's harsh he's bombastic he's rude uh, people quickly uh, hate him. Even those who support him have to hold the nose to do it. And so, that, so that's what happened in, in this election. The, the benefit he was to society was not the main thing known. I bet, I bet you did not see one television commercial that said that Donald Trump did the following things for America. Instead, it was Donald Trump attacking. He was an attack Biden, ad. And yeah. it just didn't work. So I actually wanted to find out what you think about the uh, the Democratic Party at the moment, because it seems like right now they're going through an existential crisis of are are they going down a, the socialist road or not? I don't think they're going down socialist road. I think many of them are, are um, centrists are moderates. There's no question uh, that their platform 
is leaning way left, and I would even say as a Christian, immoral. Uh, and that's why a lot of folks, you know, there are a lot of a lot of evangelicals who are fairly moderate, but they just can't step on the Democratic platform, so to speak, uh, because of where it stands on abortion and gays and all kinds of other things. Um, whereas they really would agree with maybe some kind of national health care process. And they really they see that the Democrats often leave the economy in great shape and they think the poor ought to be helped by the state and things like that. But it's the morality issues that keep them off of that platform. So I don't think the Democratic Party is just completely going down the Marxist road. I do think there's a danger that some of the loudest and most media friendly voices are trying to take it socialist and left leaning. But they're not getting very far. People put up with Bernie Sanders because he's, you know, he's the, he's the dotty uncle who's making a lot of noise at Thanksgiving meal. Uh, but he hasn't pulled a large vote. He hasn't been a serious threat. AOC, the same thing. You know, she's, she's pretty and she's on Vogue magazine and, and you know, so on. But, you know, uh, her, her broadcasts from her dorm room <laughs> aren't gaining a lot of, aren't gaining a lot of uh, you know, traction. So I'm not too concerned about the squad. I'm not con- too concerned about the leftists. I'll tell you, frankly, there's a game in politics. Anchor yourself way out on the fringe, and maybe you can pull things a little bit your way. Some of these people anchor themselves on the socialist extreme because they just want to make a few inches of progress, and they find that anchoring themselves on the extreme gives them that leverage to pull the party to the left. So uh, Joe Biden's a centrist. Um, His vice president, uh, Kamala Harris, is, is much further to the left than he is. And is dangerous, I think, on the issue of religion and abortion. Um, but I don't think he's going to be pulled way left. I think the future of the Democratic Party is in danger of going far left. But I don't think during this administration. Hmm. I've I've got a quick question for you about, and uh, we'll be wrapping up our time because we want to be respectful. We know you have other things you got to get to this evening. Um, with the the way that especially in the far extremes on the left and the right, one of the things that I I have noticed is sort of pulling people um, towards the middle with people that were in the late 90s and the early 2000s, classic liberals, speaking specifically of uh, the three people that did... Um, like uh, Cynical Theories with Peter Boghossian and James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose, who are classic liberal atheists that are now seeing this sort of rise in their own you know, popularity and the sales of their books from people that are more centrist Christians. And what is your take on how these two groups being you know, classic liberal atheists and now the centric Christians that seem to be coming together on a political spectrum? And what do you see the future of that being? And do you think there's a danger in it? Uh, I don't think there's a danger in, in it as long as the Christians uh, are, to use the fancy phrase, epistemologically aware. As long as they know where they're coming from, as long as they know what they believe, why they believe what they believe. Um, you know, politics makes strange bedfellows, as somebody once said. You end up allying and teaming with people that, would, that frankly surprise you. Uh, at a light level, uh, I'm a Protestant, but I work with a huge number of Catholics on on pro-life issues, just, just as a small example. Um, so, And I, I work with Muslims on other kinds of issues. Um, so I think you find yourself teaming up with people who aren't like you. I'm not that concerned about that. I think there's a lot we can learn as a, those Christians who are uh, active in our uh, current politics could learn a lot from classic liberals. Obviously, they need to stay away from the atheism. Obviously, they need to realize the rationalism. Uh, but there, but there's some wisdom there. I mean, much of our much of our American political system is rooted in some of those thinkers, uh, and it's okay. I mean, Socrates wasn't a believer either. Plato wasn't either a believer either. You know, Condorcet and uh, Diderot and Rousseau and all the boys uh, who are the intellectual forefathers of our country, so to speak. And of course, including scripture. Um, you know, they all added something, and, and most of them were messes in some way. So uh, we have to learn how to take good ideas, no matter the source, make them our own, uh, and then move forward. So I'm not too concerned about it as long as the Christians know who they are and know in whom they have believed. Just thank you again, Stephen Mansfield, author of uh, Men on Fire. Um, Tell you what, if you don't mind, we do have a sign-off saying, if if you wouldn't mind saying, um, Stephen, this is Stephen Mansfield, you know, however you want to identify yourself with... uh, you know, best-selling author or whatever. Um, and then this is why you should never listen to the Reverend and the Reprobate podcast. It's a little tongue in cheek. <laughs> this is Stephen Mansfield, New York Times best-selling author and speaker. And this is why you should not ever even log on or watch the Reverend and the Reprobate.
You're the man. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thanks very much. You have a great See evening. God bless, God buddy. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye. Hands peeled. It's also nice to not be in your suit. Yeah. Yeah. Like that was is, the first thing. There, there after, is uh, there is something to that. You know, cut. You, hold on. Yep. Yeah. And also, I was glad he let us off the hook with the, uh, you don't have to dress up. I, I'm i I'm around guys and they're just they're wearing their underwear and t-shirts. Yeah, that'll be Perfect. great. That'll be great next time. Yeah, next time. Yeah. We'll do, <laughs> we'll do underwear and t-shirts. <laughs> I don't know that that's what I'm gonna do next time, but yeah, this was this was much different than the interviews we've done in the past. Yeah. Um, a lot of the guys that we've we've interviewed before are experts in their fields, but they're not. I I guess they're not such uh, purveyors of or conveyors rather of information like he is it was i mean the the guy's written over 20 books but this felt like absorbing you know information or water through through a fire hydrant Mm -hmm. like that's that's what it was like or water through a fire hose i think is the is the actual phrase but there was so much happening and it and we we were talking about in in our little in between time it almost felt like we were half a beat behind on the questions because it seemed like he was already answering something that my mind yeah, was getting yeah. to, but hadn't gotten to yet. Yeah, he's he's done this before, like we talked about. Yeah, he's, oh for he's sure. A, he's a world renowned speaker, author. He's written twenty books. Was it twenty? Over over twenty. I've got eight of them. <laughs> yeah, and and there are like some of the books it's that I have aren't even this pile is really embarrassing. Is. It was funny when uh, we were first talking to him before I. Was, I pointed to my pile of books and I was like actually this is my personal can you come autograph no I didn't ask him if he could yeah. come do that but uh, but I've read these I've had a ton of, um, of people that I've given these books to that has completely changed their perspective on certain things we roll our our young men in our youth group uh, a lot of our college men go through these books especially the Mansfield's book of manly men because it's so like I, I guess it just speaks really to the core of who we know we are in our hearts. And again, with uh, with his book, Killing Jesus, and, and we talked to him about this before the interview, I feel like he writes in a way that makes it more intellectually available than some other authors, hmm. right? The, even then, and as much as I love the book Wild at Heart, even more than, than John Eldridge, because he's he's telling stories, He's not preaching to you about like, this is why you need to be, you know, this type of man. And this is where you failed. He, he tells, and he uses Winston Churchill and and Teddy Roosevelt a lot as examples, but the chapter titles are attributes like humor. This is why, you know, humor is important to hear some stories about how men have used humor in their lives or stories about leaders that have used humor or have been in humorous situations. And you know, the same thing with friendship. He uses biblical examples. He uses examples of world leaders, but those examples are things that we can relate to. And it's not like here, here are a bunch of theories on manhood or here are a bunch of things that you should do as a man. Like here are examples of men actually doing these things, playing these things out. What do you think you can learn from that? And there was so much of what he was talking about that felt like it was that exact thing in Ben Shapiro's speak speed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned uh, absorbing, trying to drink through a, a fire hose, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I'm going to be absorbing that for a, for quite a while. There's a no lot, doubt. There's a lot that he said that I couldn't speak to at the moment, but I'm going to be absorbing. Yeah, I I really, that's the, the first interview situation that I've been in where I felt like I was trying to keep up Mm -hmm. instead of trying to sort out my next question. Like as he was finishing up a thought, I felt like I was about three words behind catching up to, to where he was because everything he said, and I'll I'll steal this, uh, this phrase from, um, uh, a friend of mine who, who teaches pastors that each thing he said was pregnant with meaning. Yeah. That he he used so many different phrases and things that I'd never heard of um, before that I was only familiar with because of his books or because of his podcasts, which are phenomenal. And we need to uh, to definitely promote that. You need to check him out on Facebook, on Instagram. Um, all of his podcasts will have them linked in there. Mansfield writes. 
Uh, I think it's his Twitter handle. It's also his Instagram thing. And then you've got Stephen Mansfield TV, um, Great Man TV, Great Man. and, uh, and Great Man one word. Yeah, one word. Like and Florida Man. Like Florida Man. <laughs> I think right? that's the best way to explain yeah, it. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> and uh, so those are absolutely incredible resources that you can you can get a hold of if you liked what what Stephen said. And they're bite size, and maybe that was part of uh, each one of his answers was this. It was 45 minutes worth of information crammed into Mm -hmm. a couple of minutes. Like there were so many things that we could unpack. You know, we, we talked about the definition of, you know, the warrior spirit and the idiot man and, and the dog man. But there was a phrase that he continued to use controlled rowdiness that he used three or four times where we were finally like, Hey, what does this mean? Yeah. Um, Well, we both instinctually knew what it meant yeah absolutely everything that he he says i think at least to me speaks to the core of of my masculinity right like i understood exactly what it meant controlled rallyness i do that with my son all the time right it's something that we both need we both need i almost told him but i didn't want to interrupt him or get off topic because he had right. a lot of good information but oh man i almost told him this for me is controlled rowdiness in a uh, lot of ways yeah. he mentioned uh Football, uh, not football, uh, uh, basketball, sports. Racquetball. That's not really my jam. Right. I, I My version of rowdiness is is talking and joking mm-hmm. around and getting a little on the edge of things sometimes. Yeah. Uh, that's what I really enjoy. And this, this for me, you know, I, I think we've talked about this enough, but um, having the brotherhood and having the friendship, especially now, at any time, but especially now with if, with all of the seclusion that's going on, I could totally relate with what he was talking about. Oh, absolutely. And one of the things he talks about, specifically in Mansfield's book of, of Manly Men, um, is the, the type of relationship with masculinity that men have and that being a, a masculine man and being a good man does not mean that you have to be of the the sort of a like Greek god stature, you don't have to be somebody that's yeah. way into sports or athletics, and you see that a lot with maybe like, Hephaestus. I'm you're gonna have to talk to me about a what Greek is Hephaestus. God. Oh gosh, yeah. he's he's the blacksmith. Yeah. He's the paunchy. <laughs> yeah, you don't. Uh, I'm I'm following you now. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, was not a very all of nerdy us. Joke. Not not everybody's gonna be Adonis. So <laughs> yeah. his. Uh, his definition of, of that, I think, is really important. It's, it's in that, that book. I would encourage everybody to read it. And I do mean everybody to read it. If you have a man. Except for um, you. Yeah, no. If, but do go smash that like button. Oh, my gosh. You're fired. <laughs> if, you, if you have a man in your life, this is a book that you should read. If you're a mom of boys, um, if you are a, a wife that's trying to to better understand your husband, um, if you are a dad that you know you're you're not only you're trying to shape your your kids, but you're seeing that you might be the only male figure in the lives of your kids' friends. There's so many single moms right now that the only male figure that's in the lives of these kids are their you know the friends are the the dads of their friends. Mm -hmm. This is something that is just one of those, it speaks directly to the heart of men. You were talking, there's a lot of those things that we just instinctively Oh, control routing. I know exactly what he's talking about. Well, he would also say that like, uh, not just this. Some of the moms hate. That we're doing, it it can be. (laughs) Hey, knock it off. Yeah. We're not breaking anything. We're just wrestling. Yeah, it's fine, right? We moved all the furniture out of the middle of the room. Yeah, there's a little blood, but it's fine. Yeah, I'm keeping him away. We covered the the (laughs) fireplace with a pool noodle it's okay yeah. <laughs> but one of the other ways that i i think a controlled rowdiness is like with the inklings are you familiar with the inklings the inklings were these this group of writers it was J.R. tolkien it was c.s lewis it was lewis's brother and several other guys and where where controlled rowdiness was for them they didn't get out and fight one another or anything like that what they did though was they critiqued one another's works Mm. And that as they gathered together and began to like critique one another's works, well, pardon me, Tolkien was writing the Lord of the Rings and people were talking to him about all the crazy stuff that was in the Lord of the Rings. Lewis was writing uh, the Chronicles of Narnia yeah. and Tolkien didn't like it. Yeah, he was like, why is there a lion in here talking R- yeah, lion? He was, come on. He, he had a problem with how. What about Bombadil? Uh, Tolkien. 
Why don't you quit being so, so judgmental? Well, I mean, I love Tom Bombadil. I'm just saying it doesn't really fit. <laughs> it doesn't resonate as well. Yeah, it doesn't fit as much. You know, he. We've talked about this already. I don't want to go down that road again. Sure. But, I mean, there's a reason Bombadil wasn't in the movies, right? Yeah. Because so, it makes no sense. So there's, there's this type of controlled rowdiness that might just be, you know, critiques of work, intellectual sparring, whatever that is, is that we, we need something to push against, a goal to push back against. I, I really liked his um, bringing in the, you know, and, and for a 95 year old man, controlled rowdiness might be making a lap around the mall, Yeah, you know, and then making that your goal. Well, I've never thought of things that way, but yeah. I think Mm -hmm. controlled rowdiness for some of the older guys in our church is the Thursday morning meeting that we have up here with our building committee where they bring coffee and donuts. And I, I nearly every week have a video of one of them saying something just completely off the wall this past week. The, this guy, he's 85 years old. He's one of my most favorite human beings in the world. He was talking to us about how if, uh, if you see a woman who is a Uh-oh, woman of some flag. of some size, right, that you red shouldn't flag number two. you shouldn't say he's got a problem with the fact that people, you know, are saying that they're thick or things like that. And he's mm-hmm. like, that's not a term of endearment. You should say that she's pleasingly plump. <laughs> it's horrible. It's the <laughs> worst way to say that. And then the other myself, the other guys, and my poor secretary. I'll end up in this conversation with them about like, no, you can't say that. And it turns into this, you know, four on one argument, but that is, he loves it and he does it every week. He will say something that he knows is going to turn the room against him in a way that's humorous because that is for him a, a way to have that controlled rowdiness. And I think that's that's, what I'm talking about. Yeah. That's That's such an important thing. You, you do have a tendency to do that. I love derailing you or getting you to, we we have a we have a picture that's my favorite one where something something off the wall happened and i have a picture forever of you going like what are you doing <laughs> i i it's do my favorite picture of you i now. do remember that <laughs> i remember awesome. that very vividly so awesome we man <laughs> that was really early on and i think we can tell part of the story that, really early on in our in our podcast experiments when we were trying to figure out whether or not this actually had legs and who knows whether or not it does still. Mm-hmm. But when we were trying to or get what kind that, of legs it has, maybe yeah. it's bionic or possibly like Darth Maul's six legs. legs, like a, like a spider, except that they're, they're or, supposed to be eight, like an insect. Yeah. In, all yeah. insects have okay. six legs. I'm done yeah, derailing. Go. go ahead. Okay. So we had this, uh, we had a guest on who, was supposed to talk to us about some of the sort of dark conspiracy theories that were going on. And they had decided they were a little nervous. Mm -hmm. And so they were going to, they had opted to consume an adult beverage in order to loosen themselves up. brown water. Yes. Yeah. Brown water. I think is what he said, right? Yeah. Yeah. And... And he did not stop at one brown waters. Yeah. Um, he continued on with brown water by the time that when we started to discuss with him what our topics were going to be for that evening that we wanted to talk to to this person about, they were off the rails already. And it was such an uncomfortable setting that we could not get that person off air without mm. just completely rent it's, it's a person that we're friends with. And so we didn't want to like boot them and potentially ruin or damage yeah. a relationship. So for about 25 minutes, <laughs> we're having a very incoherent conversation. Uh, albeit, you know, looking back on it, it was, it's funny now, six months removed from it. Yeah. At, in the moment you were really upset. Yeah. You were really I was, frustrated. I was mad, but, and I was, retrospect, I was cracking up. Yeah. In retrospect, uh, Number one, that was very funny. It was. Um, number two, we now have content for our for our paywall for our subscribers. Yeah, so if, if you do want to subs- sub- oh subscribe, my here we go with this again. If you want to be a subscriber, yes, go to our website. Uh huh. Roll up a dollar bill as, and as shove you said it into in, your, in our most recent episode. Reprend and rep. Rev and rep dot com. Rev and rep dot com. Uh, yeah. Just roll up a dollar bill, whatever you want to give, and shove it in your USB drive, and then that will get to us through the magic of the internet. Yep. Yeah, that is. So that will get you past the paywall. It's and, true. And then uh, you can see this this video that 
that we will never release. Yeah, Dan Lee is talking about true, noble, honest, masculine things right now when he's telling you Capitalism. to... Capitalism. Yeah, exactly. You got to pay um, for it if you want to see it. I was referring more to the fact that you're lying to people and ruining their computers by telling them to oh, shove yeah. it. Yeah. So, by telling them to shove it, that'll just be an isolated thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, Mansfield just had so many incredible things to say, and there's so much stuff that we didn't get to. Uh, we wanted to be respectful of his time. He's on the East Coast, so he's an hour ahead of us. He had another interview that was butted up right against ours, and so there were a couple of questions that we stopped short of asking intentionally um, because we – it was almost one of those things where I feel like he could have gotten through them because of how quick he talks and how fast that guy's brain works. <laughs> but I don't know that we could have asked the questions in a coherent yeah. enough way trying to absorb all that extra information. A little behind the scenes, we had worked on some questions ahead of time, mm -hmm. and we had kind of whittled them down, and 14 minutes in, we were out. Yeah, we were out of the 11 questions that we had prepared. Yeah. Gone. Already gone through. And so we... Uh, he, he is a pro. D there's no two ways about it. Yeah. I... And we are not. <laughs> we're, we're getting we're getting closer. This was, I think, the most um, informationally intense Dense. interview we've had we've had yeah. so far. I really found his, and as I always have, as uh, a, not just a fan of his but, um, through through his writing, but also his podcast. He really does seem to have a very down the middle approach whenever it comes to um, political things and. He was he was talking about Donald Trump, and I think that he went from a factual base instead of an opinion base with some of the things that that Trump has done. But he also talks about how Trump got in his own way. Now, in his podcast, if if you go back and listen to the 2016, as they're going through the Republican primaries, he is thinking that there's no way that Trump can win. He he says everybody thought that. Well, I he, did. He says in, I was in like, the this beginning, this is a hilarious, that, you know, yeah, that it's just a joke. It's a hilarious hiccup in the middle right. of it. Yeah, like okay, whatever. And and now he's talking about the very real possibility of a 2024 run if Trump doesn't do this, and that that might become the new GOP standard. Uh, he also mentioned the danger of identity politics and where there's a this sort of uh, amoral or, or vastly different moralistic worldview in a lot of the things that are that are happening on the left. What I did find most interesting, though, was the way that he talked about the atheists and the Christian communities, the classic liberalists and those who are more centralist uh, politically that, that are religious people or, or Christians, um, that them working together is a positive thing from a political perspective, but how important it is that those Christians especially know what they believe because there are a lot of atheists that are in the political sphere that understand why they're atheists. Now, Greg Kokel will tell you, we've we've talked a lot about the book Tactics before, the the guy that coined the phrase like putting a rock in somebody's shoe um, whenever you're having a discussion with him, mm -hmm. that there are a lot of people that would claim atheism but have no real idea what that means. They don't even know what classical atheism is. And so they claim to be atheists because they think that they don't believe in God, but they don't really know what they believe is atheist. And we have a lot of those same people in the Christian realm, but it just so happens that those people in the Christian realm tend to be a lot more politically active and motivated and yet don't have a great fundamental foundation for uh, Christian belief. And if, if I can plug something here from our church, we've got a great series right now that we're doing on fundamentals. It's a video series um, as well as a, an in-person thing that we're doing. Where we're going over the fundamentals of faith so that we can create that basis because we found the same thing just within the people in our church. And uh, I, I just thought it was really interesting how he honed in on that particular piece, that it's not dangerous for them to work together for political means if the Christian knows what they believe and aren't going to be swayed by the argument of the atheist. As long as they're grounded in, uh, epistemologically. Yeah. Which which was the word he used. And I had to think about that. I was like, okay. Yeah, you're breaking it, it, down the roots. It, it means it. What's the, what's the, the, uh, the origin of the word, please? It's, just, it starts, it it starts with the word E, which means extra, and then <laughs> pistological, which means there's a there's a gun in there, so we gotta be careful. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just, there's I'm just playing around. there's a lot of of that that we're we're seeing in 
um, not just modern Christianity, but in in modern Western thought in general, mm-hmm. is that I can claim to believe something, but that doesn't mean that I actually have to know what I believe. And uh, you know, he he mentioned some philosophers and things like that, um, Socrates in particular, and uh, and Aristotle. When you look at the writings of Paul, when you look at the um, particularly the writings of Malachi in the Old Testament, that what you see happen in those situations is. Um, or in those books, is you see Socratic dialect. You see where Aristotle's rhetoric and some of the scenarios that Aristotle had come up with are played out in Paul's writings because there's things that were taught the same way that we would, you know, discuss history. That's where, you know, they were um, from a philosophical standpoint. Paul uses and uh, the rhetoric layout that Aristotle puts forth in order to create and make arguments throughout the uh, the Pauline epistles and then again we see the author of Hebrews where he goes to great lengths to talk about something that was a um, a sort of a parable that was told by by Aristotle and some of the philosophers because those were the things that the people they were writing to readily had available to him it was known knowledge at the time and so we've seen this intersection before I thought that was a really interesting thing as it came to um, not just political means but in order to bring understanding in order of furtherance of the gospel but all of that hinged on the fact that the guys that were talking about it had this deep rootedness in what they actually believed. And though Paul never, um, you know, walked with Jesus, he wasn't one of Jesus's 12 disciples. He had this background in, um, in the law because he was a Pharisee. And then whenever he became a Christian, now he, he sees that Jesus was the fulfillment of all these messianic prophecies. And so he has this incredible legalistic and theological and intellectual view of what all of that is and how it works together. And so he's able to pull from both worlds. I, I think that that's not only a great thing that we have the opportunity to do now, but also that it, It is like he said, it hinges purely on whether or not we are going to be able to stay rooted in our own belief system. And and that's a a really clear and and present danger, I think, for uh, for the Christian today, especially as we are becoming more politically minded or having to, uh, I guess, succumb to some of the pressure of making our political beliefs known and and. And we do, we find ourselves at this really dangerous crossroads that we have to make a decision. Are we going to, and I wanted to ask him just for comedy's sake, um, who Jesus would have voted for. Mm-hmm. And uh, and maybe Jesus would have voted for Spike Jorgensen um, <laughs> from the Libertarian Party. Who knows? Maybe maybe Jesus would have written himself in. Um, I think Jesus, no, I'm not going to stop there. Yeah, yeah, there, Jesus is the I ultimate I was going to say king. Kanye. Yeah, it's but great. Then I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah no. Uh, Jesus is the ultimate king, the ultimate authority. Kanye's the only one that's so, got a, uh, 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 not really a worship album, but a. It it is the the new album very much leaned towards towards yeah. that direction. I mean, there was a choir. Yeah, there was. There was, um, but I, I think the idea that Jesus would have voted for somebody is one of the biggest politically errant statements that people within uh, especially the the Protestant and evangelical church sphere tend to make I I don't know that he would have participated at all in our political stuff not that he doesn't think that you know this isn't what I believe Jesus's constitutional views would have been that he wouldn't yeah. see this as a civil right or whatever what do you think Jesus's favorite TV show would Ex- be except to, I'll get to that in a second <laughs> except to ask the there's all kinds of ridiculous things question, right but yeah who, who do you think I, Morgan Mindy. Oh, <laughs> no, no. But I think the, uh, I think the thing with Jesus is what Jesus would have no reason to vote for anybody. He's the ultimate authority on heaven and on earth for him to vote for somebody would, would mean that he's going to give this person, he's going to appoint them dominion over a certain area and give them stewardship over it when he's already done that. But does, did he not underst- understand that? You do need government. You always know, said render to Caesar oh, on, sure. on that which is Caesar. Absolutely. This is this is a weird conversation, yeah, no, but no. but it is it Worth is having. interesting. It is yeah. interesting. I think he would have voted. I I would say Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords sort of is above. But also he humbled himself. He he did 
right? Oh, wait, we're going toe to toe. That, that was then, <laughs> right? Epistologically. Yeah, we are. Um, but as as he is now, like when he comes back, it's going to be really bad news for mm-hmm. a lot of people. Mm-hmm. It's going to be very bad. It's going to be pretty terrible. <laughs> um, but that's the thing is. A lot of people are going to be ve- and, treated very fairly. In order for, for Jesus to come down now and to vote. Not he very would, nice. Yeah, he would be giving up a crown a second time. And that's not something he intends to do. Yeah. So I, I just think that the idea of those arguments that people are making, well, this is who, this is God's candidate. This is Jesus candidate, or, you know, God's putting his man Mm. in the office. It's you're, you're going to say God's putting his man in the office because it's the guy that you wanted to be Mm. there. If you believe that God is sovereign, then the gospel and our stewardship of the gospel has to be first. As a matter of fact, Paul says that we owe a debt to the Greeks and the barbarians, to the wise and the foolish, and that debt that's owed is the gospel, that we owe the gospel to others. And when we put our, our politics and our, our policies and, and those things ahead of that, then we make God the secondary item. We make Jesus the secondary item. And so if in our minds Jesus is secondary because we're trying to figure out how he would vote and try to push that belief on others, um, then we've already got our priorities out of whack and and we don't have a real great leg to stand on whenever we're speaking on those things in particular. That's good. I like that. I agree. I, I think Mansfield's assertion of um, Trump's uh, concession, I think is, is pretty interesting. Yeah. It, also the idea that he does run in 2024 mm-hmm. immediately when he said that I thought of two things. Yeah. The, the complete meltdown that's going to happen should he yeah. run again? Because now they're they're cheering that the witch is dead, right? The at least at least the the far left. There are some that are, yeah, for sure. Um, and also, I started thinking about the rise of Skywalker. When you think the Emperor is dead, but really he's in the Sith world, creating this unstoppable fleet. That when when it rises again, yeah, I'm not. I don't know what parallel I'm trying to make here. This is just what popped into my head. <laughs> <laughs> we don't, not everything has to be allegorical. Yes. Yeah. Right. I'm not saying that Trump is the emperor. I'm also not saying that he's not the emperor. <laughs> <laughs> right. D- time will tell. Yeah. I, I do. I was talking to a good friend of mine from Canada last night and he, he put things into an interesting perspective for me because we were talking specifically about where, um, the um, political climate in the United States is viewed like, you know, how many thousands and thousands of feet in the air are these other countries looking at and spying it? There's, yeah, there's so many people outside of this. They've right. got to be looking in. And so they, they are because the United States is a very influential country on the world stage. And mm-hmm. one of the things he was talking about is he's like, dude, we just don't understand yeah. how you guys are so party entrenched. And I was like, okay, well, explain what that means to me. So he, he says, I'm not going to say his name. He goes, you know, we looked at Trudeau and I voted for Trudeau because he had these great platforms and these things. And he was this young guy and he's got great hair and all this stuff. And I'm like, okay. He goes, and he, he came in with a lot of energy. Same and he thing said, we liked about Trump. <laughs> great platforms. <laughs> love his hair. So, so he goes and he says, so I voted for Trudeau, right? Yeah. Which is the liberal candidate up there. And he's like, now I'm so sick of him that every, I don't believe anything that he says. I think he's been spineless. I don't think he's been good for Canada. And if he runs again, you know, well, I am totally voting for the other party. Not because it's a vote against, you know, the liberals, but just to restore order. And what happens in Canada, and if you look at the voting history, is that there is this sort of pendulum swing. It happens okay. here too. Yeah, everybody is over here. But it's with, instead of it being... Um, so much with like the, these groups of people are conservative, these groups of people, if you were to look at the, at the States that were red and blue, Mm -hmm. imagine that every, you know, four years that it just turns that blue. they just switched yeah, okay okay, okay right yeah, that yeah, all yeah. the red states became blue states all the blue states became whereas, red states whereas now and texas then, is red oh yeah, yeah yeah and california is blue. blue right but just imagine that in four years the california just all of a sudden went to the conservative party and people would be like what in the world is going on and then you know 
Michigan and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, and uh, let's throw uh, North Carolina and Georgia and Arizona in there. So all of these swing states, all of a sudden they went to the libertarians because they were sick of everybody. That that's not unheard of in Canada, mm. whereas the way that the two-party system has really become ingrained in our culture here, it it has. And so from the outside looking in, that's what he was talking about is, you know, he voted for the Liberal Party last time. He's going to vote for the Conservative Party this time because he's just so sick of it and they didn't hold into any of their promises. And they really do hold, instead of the, the towing the party line, they hold the person accountable for whether or not they were able to come through on their, on their campaign promises. It's hard to promises. argue that logic. Furthermore, his big thing that looking from the outside in, he was like, didn't your, your very, like, left-leaning activist groups, right? Let's keep names and stuff out of it. Weren't they in support of of uh, of Joe Biden? He goes, and now I see that they are actually wrecking the, you know, the <laughs> yeah. White House parties that are being thrown for him in celebration of his victory. I was like, yeah, man, I don't really know what is going on. And, and also those were peaceful, peaceful protests. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, fantastic. <laughs> At, to to bring that around back though to to the Mansfield interview is one of the things he was talking about specifically as it relates to all of those things is one of the the joys and responsibilities of being a man in this time is that we're here because this is the time that we were created for mm-hmm. and that there's a mantle that needs to be picked up there is a responsibility that we have to ourselves to our families to the men that are in our our band of brothers and, and the next generation hard to create that. Yeah. i really liked what he said about that too yeah that, that we have a responsibility to do our best right now mm-hmm. which is not something that somebody else tells us is this is what your best can be but instead that the way that our faith should influence our our person our masculinity and and the responsibility that we have to those things that our best should be striving for, you know, the righteousness of God during this time and allowing that to be the primary driving force behind our leadership. And that was something that, you know, not just as a, as a pastor, but now as a, as a husband who is young in marriage, you know, those are, those are the things that I really want. That's the legacy that I want to leave behind that, you know, when the students in our church who have grown up with me as their youth pastor and now that I'm their pastor and, and you know, Lord willing, the, the children that we'll have um, for, you know, when when my time here is done, that the legacy that I would have left behind is, you know, my my dad or my pastor, or my youth pastor, or whatever, um, was a man who strove after God's righteousness and led us during the season that he was here in a way that that was God honoring. I think that that's just such a cool, um, not idea. Uh, it is a cool idea, but more than that, that it is a really cool, very powerful mandate that we've been given and uh, that we have to stop neglecting as men. That's good. I don't know a better way to end the podcast than with that. All right. Well, before thank you Stephen the Mansfield yes thank uh, you very much was, it was and, fantastic having you on and thank you Karen Montgomery for being the behind the scenes lady yeah. that just man when we were at a loss for some things and Karen works very closely with with Stephen thank you so much for your guidance thanks for making this happen mm-hmm. you are an absolute gem and we really appreciate you so yeah and what was Ch- your other thing Ch- check out any of his 20 plus books including mm-hmm. the book of man mansfield's book of manly men and men on fire which is his new book yeah his his new book and part of the the trifecta of that stuff you can find steven mansfield on facebook at mansfield rights on twitter at mansfield rights on instagram at mansfield rights uh look at steven mansfield tv and great man dot tv to find his books his podcasts and everything that he's got going on thank you guys once again for yep. uh, for checking us out for another um really fun interview that we got to do yeah. with we, as it says in the title with somebody that we literally have no business I was talking about to, to. That. Yeah. yeah yeah i mean that guy's gonna forget we're, more stuff than we're combined ever gonna know when we were dreaming up this podcast that was what we wrote of it's two guys talking to people that we think are cool that we have no business talking to Thank you for coming on, Stephen Mansfield. Yep. All right. We'll see you guys next week. Yeah. Next week.
to the Gospels. <laughs> okay. Right? Outside of the Gospels, if there was, I got asked the question a couple of years ago, if you could add one book to the Bible, if God gave you permission, what would it be? And I was like, first off, I don't think he would do that. But second, if there was like a, an appendix that I was allowed to add to it, it would be Killing Jesus by Stephen Mansfield because I think it's, oh, it's the best of that's that. That's so, great. Thank you so much. And by the way, don't talk him out of that. When, he, when he's complimenting me, just sit there and be quiet. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I will keep that in just, mind. And, and also, and also I will never, you. Thank you. I will never.